Hello and welcome to the recorded lesson for uh, the last lesson of the Jacksonian Democracy Unit. In this lesson, we are focusing on Andrew Jackson's policies and decisions that influence the Native American tribes living in the southeast portion of the United States um, in the 1820s. So in this uh, time period, the there are a lot of tribes of Native Americans that their homes are all within the southeast of the United States. So we're talking states like Alabama, Georgia, um, Tennessee, those areas. Um, and at this point, what we are seeing in the United States is a lot of growth in the eastern part of the United States on the East Coast. So as more and more settlers kind of um, move into the Native American areas, these white settlers and Native Americans are definitely going to get into conflict. White settlers really want one of two things to happen. If you're a Native American and you're living your life peacefully out in your own territory that you've lived on for hundreds of years, they are going to move into your area, the white settlers are, and they want you to do one of two things. They want you to either be like the white settler, so change your culture, change the way that you are living and be like the white settler, or they want you to leave so they don't have to think about you. So the first option is called assimilate. Assimilate means to basically be absorbed into another's culture or way of life. So you could kind of think of this like if you were to go to maybe a new school and things were very different there. Maybe um, they really were into something or one style of music that you had never been into before. And they really kind of look down on you because you're not into that. And the way that you kind of assimilate into that situation is to basically start to uh, get into that kind of music or get into that style or get into something that is similar to what they are doing. So you're kind of changing your ways to blend in or be kind of absorbed into their way of life. So that's the first option. Assimilate, be like the white settler, kind of go with the flow or get out and move into the Western areas past the Mississippi River where the white settler will not have to worry about the Native American. So basically they're saying, get out or be like us. Many uh, white settlers, uh, just you know, American citizens at this time, white American citizens felt that the Native Americans were uncivilized and they did not want to live by them. So they basically view them as less than themselves. By the 1820s, there are about 100,000 Native Americans living east of the Mississippi River. So that is not where we are right now. We are currently in Missouri. Um, we are west of the Mississippi River. So we're talking about if we were to go towards Tennessee, Kentucky, towards the eastern coast of the United States. Most of these live in the southeastern part of the United States, and there are five main tribes that live in this area that are going to be affected um, by Andrew Jackson's policies towards Native Americans. And those are the Cherokee, uh, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Seminole. And uh, later in this, later in these slides, I'll show you a map of kind of where those areas are and where these Native Americans are going to be ultimately forced to relocate. In these five major tribes that we're talking about in the Southeast, they had lands that span over states of Georgia, the Carolinas, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and Tennessee. And one of the things that I think is important to remember is that the Native Americans had been there long before the states had been there. 
So these state lines, these um, boundaries, they they are they are non factors in Native American tribes. So some tribes could span over three, four states, um, and some could be just within one. But it it the state boundaries are so um, not in not a factor on where these Native Americans live, travel, um, hunt, just where their territory is. It's just, it's just a very different way of life and a way of establishing themselves as the white settlers had. More than any other tribe out of these five that we're focusing on, the Cherokee tried their best to assimilate into white culture and um, just kind of be more of a blended in approach to try to keep their territory and keep their way of life as best they could, but also assimilate to be closer to the white settler. They created a written language, which is something that um, some Native Americans did not have. So that um, makes them more closely aligned with white settlers. They sent their children's to mission, children to missionary schools to be taught um, the Christian teachings. Uh, they created a newspaper. They wrote a, a constitution for their Cherokee Nation based on the U.S. Constitution. So they're taking steps to try to please the white settler, to try to please the United States of America, to try to keep their territory, to try to keep their uh, way of life. Andrew Jackson had long been supportive of moving Native Americans west. He saw the Native Americans as a conquered people. They, he saw that these people had lived here before. The uh, settlers, the uh, explorers, the conquistadors, whatever you look back on in history, that these people had come to the, the North American continent and conquered these Native Americans and that they were living they were people that were living in the United States as conquered people. And he felt, again, they had two choices, um, assimilate or leave the country. You can either practice our laws, be like us, do what we want or leave. He did not think that they could stay inside the United States and set up their own government. So the Cherokee tried their best to, you know, hey, we are our Cherokee nation. We're going to try to follow the rules that you have, but we are also our kind of own thing within the United States. But he said, no, there's no way that that can happen. We can't, we can't have a, a government inside of our government. In 1828, gold was discovered in, um, on Cherokee land. So now it's kind of a twofold approach here. You have white settlers wanting Cherokees to get out because they just don't like Native Americans, but also there's gold and that's going to be a big factor in wanting to get these Native Americans off of that land because these white settlers are going to want to come in and get all of that gold. So this now things are really going to be kind of looking uh, uh, dire for the Cherokee and other Native American tribes. Jackson asked Congress to pass a law that would qu require Native Americans to either move west or follow state laws. So this is another problem where Native American tribes don't just, they aren't just in one specific state. They, they need to, they have territory all over in different states across state borders. And the national government is basically telling them now, you either have to follow exactly what the states say, which could be normal stuff, but also could be really laws that ultimately are really kind of um, prejudice against Native Americans. You can either move west or follow those state laws. Some Americans didn't like this idea. They thought that it wasn't right to force Native Americans to leave and it would cause a lot of suffering. But in the early 1800s, that is definitely going to be a minority of people. Um, the overwhelming majority of people are going to kind of look down on these Native American tribes and really want to force them to move west or to be like them. After a lot of debate in Congress, um, they do end up passing a law known as the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And there's not a lot of uh, guesswork in deciding what the Indian Removal Act 
does, it's right there in the title. It is simply passed in a law that is trying to remove Indians, um, remove Native Americans from their homeland. This is going to lead kind of to one of the, um, but the biggest, the biggest kind of stain on Andrew Jackson's uh, presidency and his legacy, and that's going to be the Trail of Tears. Jackson immediately set out to enforce the Indian Removal Act. He claimed that the law was just or fair and would allow Native Americans to keep their way of life and just in a different spot. Basically, he's saying, hey, you can, you're fine. You get to do whatever you want. You get to practice your Native American culture and religions and beliefs, and you can have your own setup of whatever you want. You just can't do it here. You've got to do it somewhere else. But the problem here is that if you've ever, if you've ever been to Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, the Carolinas, it it's very um, there's there's forests, there's mountains. Um, if you had lived there for hundreds of years as a as a Cherokee nation, and now you are being forced to move, where are they going to move you that is going to be similar to that? Um, Unfortunately, they are going to move them to the Great Plains and to the Indian Territory, which is modern day Oklahoma. And the simple fact is Oklahoma is nothing like the areas in the southeast of the United States. And because of that, you cannot say that these Native Americans are just going to be relocated to Oklahoma. And now they can just practice their same way of life and same way of living because they're going to have to learn how to cultivate the land, farm, uh, what animals are there to hunt. Their way of life is going to be totally shattered and totally disrupted. Not only that, but the, the way that they move them from their original home to Oklahoma is going to be completely different as well and just cause a lot of suffering. Settlers would force Native Americans to ultimately sign treaties, which exchanged uh, their current land for land in Oklahoma, and this land is known as the Indian Territory. And finally, in 1838, American troops started to force Cherokees into uh, containment camps, basically to round them up, keep them there. And they're basically like, well, you can either stay in these camps or we can move you to Oklahoma, whichever you'd like. After being in these camps, they would then take them from their homes. They, well, before they got to the camps, they would take them from their homes. They basically are only leaving with the clothes that they have on their backs and what they can carry. And then they would force them to march west. So we are talking from these dark green areas on uh, the map over here. You can see that they are going to this kind of light green, yellow area. Um, that's, that's hundreds of miles um, during during the winter with little to no preparation on your part. So you are walking hundreds of miles during the winter with only the clothes on your back. And if they picked you up in August when it's 85, 90 degrees outside and then force you to walk during January, the clothes that you have are very ill-prepared and the people that are forcing you to march don't really care whether you are comfortable or surviving or anything. And because of this, over this long, miserable journey, 25% of the Cherokee population dies during the Trail of Tears. And this, again, this forced march becomes known as the Trail of Tears. Not all Native American tribes um, went, or not all Native Americans in general, just went along with this move. Some Native American tribes, tribes resist the move. In 1838, a Cherokee farmer was trying to escape with his family. He killed two U.S. soldiers and that um, he was told that if, it, if he and his sons turned themselves in, that some of the Cherokees could stay on their land. He did end up turning himself in. He was executed and some of the Cherokees were allowed to stay. So, um, just an example of Cherokees kind of trying to rise up. But when you are the Cherokee nation going against the U S government and the U S army, um, things are not going to be very easy for you in Florida. The Seminoles 
led by Osceola, raged war against the U.S. They would um, basically do everything they can to hide out, uh, fight, and resist this move. They did win many b battles, but ultimately Osceola was captured when he was tricked into thinking a meeting was uh, for peace talks. So kind of some dirty tactics all the way from the start of the Indian Removal Act to the end. Um, you know, they trick him into thinking, hey, yeah, come on, we're going to talk maybe a peace treaty. And then they just capture him. And that kind of when the leader of a movement like that is captured, the, the movement is pretty much going to end. So Indian removal, Trail of Tears for Andrew Jackson, um, a very kind of dark close to his presidency, uh, a very a dark moment, dark chapter for the United States. Um, and it but it does it does signal the beginning of this this push into the West and this push for the United States to expand. And in the next um, unit and lessons, that's where we go. We, we start looking at expanding into the West and expanding into uh, these new territories.